Okay, let me, let me um, introduce our next speaker, Babak Rahimi, who is a local professor here at uh, University of California, San Diego. He's an associate professor of communication, culture, and religious studies. And uh, we're delighted that he's going to present to us Exodus in the Quran, which again is a reimagining of previous imaginings um, of the Exodus in the Middle East. Great, thank okay. you. Can I start this? Okay. I have it's no always, idea. It's always the way of the work of magic. Do we? Here no, we go. We just think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me this morning. Speaking of Exodus in the Quran, a historian would, um, how do I go forward? Do I go forward with this? Do I go forward with this? You can use this. You can just press this okay. button. It'll be easier. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. A historian of whatever perspective, would uh, argue that uh, much of the Exodus story in the Quran is very much of a retelling of the biblical narratives in 7th century Arabia, given the fact Muhammad himself was a major figure in the tribe of Quraysh in the city of Mecca, major, uh, a major commercial city. Most definitely, Muhammad had encountered the story of, of the Exodus and Moses by the Christians who were living, the Arab Christians who were living mostly in the southern parts of the Arabian Peninsula, and of course the Jewish tribes that were scattered throughout the Arabian Peninsula, especially uh, a few hours away from the city of Mecca and the city of Medina, where we had three major Jewish tribes. Um, speaking of Exodus, from a theological point of view, a Muslim scholar would argue that in fact the Exodus is a story of punishment because of the Israelites disobedience to God's commands, and it's really a major story in the Quran for the believers to follow and remember that God's disobedience follows some kind of a punishment. In fact, that has been very much of the narrative of, of the exegeses and the commentaries of the Quran with regards to the Exodus story by m many Muslims throughout the centuries. Today, I want to suggest something else. I want to say First and foremost, that that may be true, especially the historical part of it. Um, but in, in fact, the Exodus story in the Quran is a story of utopian redemption. And a very much of a performative history through which Muhammad himself, as the prophet and messenger of God, was reflecting that story as he was building the new Muslim community. What's interesting is that the story of Exodus and, uh, and Moses very much parallels Muhammad's story as he encountered persecution in the city of Mecca, uh, and eventually he had to migrate, the famous Hijra story, the way he had to migrate from the city of Mecca to Medina, and that very much was a, a very much of a, a history of a future, a day after tomorrow that needed to be achieved, and the Moses story and the Exodus story very much personified that. Uh, but just quickly, and I know time is limited, let me just briefly explain what the Quran is. And this is, I have to do this in, in a matter of five or ten minutes or even shorter than this. Um, the Quran, of course, is regarded to be the sacred book of Muslims. Uh, it's uh, a book that was compiled together um, basically a few years after the death of Muhammad in 632, Obviously, Muhammad had the revelations, according to Muslim traditions, by hearing uh, Angel Gabriel talking to him, and that itself became a revelation of God, and eventually that was compiled. And by uh, Uthman, the third caliph of Islam, it was compiled into a book of canon. We're talking about 114 surahs or chapters, uh, and all of these chapters include a total of 6,222 6, ayahs or verses. Uh, please make a note, the Quran is uh, interesting to note, it has been influenced by a number of different uh, literally and oral traditions, including the story of Gilgamesh, Alexander Romance, and of course the biblical tradition, among others, most likely Arab traditional, even perhaps to a point polytheistic traditions of 7th century Arabian Peninsula. The four key narrative aspects to the Quran, and this is going to be central to the argument I'm going to make today. One is the idea of Tawheed or monotheism. Second is the theme of apocalypse, the end of time, 
third prophetic narratives, which is really makes up a major part of the Quranic narrative, and finally legalism. 610, we get the first phase of the Quranic revelations known as the Meccan revelations. This is the time when Muhammad has apparently heard or received the revelation, and much of the revelations here revolve around the idea of apocalypse, day of judgment. But towards 620, two years before he's leaving Mecca, the Quranic revelations become highly prophetic. They are about stories of, of, of course, Jesus, Mary, not Mary, Mary was not a prophet, but nevertheless, she's also there. Moses, Abraham, of course, is a, a critical character here, uh, but also involves this famous uh, case of 620 when the prophet uh, actually had the marja or had the spiritual uh, travel uh, to Jerusalem, eventually going up to heavens, where he, on the way up to heavens, he meets Moses on the way, who recommends him to bring down the prayers from, I don't know how many, 20 to 5 prayers. 622, we get the famous hijra to Medina, the migration, because of the persecution that the early Muslim community faced in the city of Mecca, and the polytheists were there, and this is based on Muslim traditions, by the way. And in the city of Mecca, Medina, sorry, where we get the original encounter of Muhammad with the Jewish tribes, we get this increasing revelations of legalistic nature. And this is what I call hard monotheism, where the, the idea of oneness of God is now becoming not only explicit, but in fact it's becoming highly institutionalized and consolidated. Whereas with the earlier version, monotheism is still in this soft, kind of a apocalyptic, mystical uh, uh, manifestation of it. Then uh, what we get, however, with, with the Exodus story, again, I'm, I'm trying to make this as, as brief as possible. The Exodus story, it does not have a, and this is central, to, to my argument, does not have a single nor a coherent narrative in the Quran. We know that the Israelites in the, in the Quranic tradition, uh, they, are, they are very much of a wandering tribes who are lost, and because of their obedience, they had to encounter a lot of experiences. And we also know there are certain recounts of certain key episodes uh, that we find in the biblical traditions in the Quran. Now, I'm going to quickly go through this. These are some of the f more famous verses of Exodus in the Quran. Exodus, in a sense that now, you know, God orders Moses to strike the sea with his rod, so to divide and save the Israelites while drowning the Egyptian forces. So very much the, the Exodus story is in the Quran, at least the basic of it, but there are certain underlying themes that pop up, especially in the second chapter of the Quran and the 26 and the 44 chapter, where God is constantly commanding Moses to uh, of course, do certain things in order to protect the Israelites and fight against the Egyptian army. The, uh, the role of Pharaoh here in the Quranic tradition is more pronounced, perhaps, and there's a reason for that, because ultimately Pharaoh, in contrast to the Bible, his, his dead body is preserved as a reminder for future generations what God's disobedience ultimately uh, uh, could, could entail. In fact, I would argue the greatest act of punishment in the Exodus story for, in the Quranic tradition is not against the Israelite, in fact, is against Pharaoh himself. So the classical Muslim exegesis, uh, really we are talking about uh, similar to the Christian ones, quite frankly, and this has been a, a source of confusion for centuries, but, uh, and, and I think it's a confusion because we do not know exactly how this tradition exactly collaborated with the early Christian one, or whether there was a break or not. But what we do know is that it has been pretty much consistent from Al-Tabari, and he was not the first person to comment on Exodus, all the way to someone like Taba Tabai, who constantly bring out the idea that, look, the Exodus is a story of punishment against the Israelites. Now, in contemporary time, we have two um, scholars. One is Brennan Wheeler, whose work is really the best one in the field, and he has extensively worked on this. And he has also reflected on this. He does not, I don't think he claims to have an original argument about this. He simply is, is reflecting on the Muslim exegesis, exegesis about, about the Exodus story. And this book, which was published a few years ago, and this is a weird book. I don't know what this person was smoking when she wrote this book. She basically bases the argument on some really flimsy archaeological evidence about how really the Exodus story took place in Mesopotamia, and the Quran is the proof of it. And um, I don't have time to go in detail with this, but it's, it's a bit of a bizarre story. And also she argues that the Exodus story took place a thousand years before the biblical version. 
So what's the punishment story here? Um, we got the golden calf, of course, story. And we also got the refusal to enter the promised land. Uh, and of course, the punishment is, is because of God's disobedience against the Israelites. Uh, the golden calf story, and this is, by the way, a difference here in um, the Quranic tradition, or at least the, the passage, Aaron, which is the brother of Moses, he does not help in making the golden calf, if I remember my Bible correctly. He actually very much challenged the Israelites while Moses was away for 40 days. And when Moses comes back, he's like, hey, you know, how come you didn't stop them? And he actually grabs his beard. And Aaron says, look, I tried to stop them, just wouldn't listen. So Aaron is very much of a good guy in the, in the Quran. Not to say that he's a bad guy in the Bible. I'm just saying just a different, uh, uh, interesting difference between Quran and the Bible. Anyway, there are so many different interesting uh, details that we get with the golden calf story. We also get, um, and this is part of the uh, Muslim exegesis, about 70,000 Israelites who end up killing themselves as a result of the punishment for the way they end up worshiping the golden calf. The punishment story goes on and continues. I mean, Moses decides not to intercede and interfere uh, on behalf of the Israelites when God gets angry against the Israelites for worshiping the golden calf. Um, then we have this interesting passage in um, the, the surah, the second surah, and I'm going to talk about why this surah is so important. It's the longest surah in the Quran. It compromises basically one-tenth of the entire Quran. It says, O children of Israel, remember my favor that I have bestowed upon you, and that I preferred you over the world, and fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul at all, nor will intercession be accepted from it, nor will compensation be taken from it, nor will they be aided. And that's the classic Muslim commentary about the fact they believe that the, really the, the, the Exodus story is about God imposing this punishment because even Moses cannot really help out in this kind of a situation. There are other examples of the punishment tale in the Quran. Uh, there's also the plague story right there in 259. And if you notice, most of this is coming from chapter 2. Uh, but, you know, we began to get also in Quran a, a, a kind of ambiguous understanding of the, the, the Exodus story. And this is when we get also how Israelites are also given some kind of a promise for a holy land. This is not just a story of punishment. It's also a story of actually trying to find your way into the wilderness of confusion. The Surah Baghara, the Surah of the Cow, specifically relates to the Israelites, which most of the Exodus tale, by the way, comes from. This is, a, by the way, Medina uh, revelation, the, the second Surah, which is also another thing to, to make a note here, that most of the Exodus stories and also stories that relate to Moses and remember here, Moses is mentioned in the Quran 70 times, is the most mentioned prophet, in, uh, the Israelite prophet in the Quran. It, it takes place sometime from 620 to, till 622, 624. Exactly two years before Muhammad left Medina, went to the city of Mecca, I'm sorry, uh, left Mecca to, and went to the city of Medina, and then the two years that he was and he began to establish the early Muslim community. I think that's critical. Because to me, my understanding is that he's trying to tell the early Muslim community something in which he's taking Moses as the model and the Exodus story as an interesting performative story to live, in, to live through. Um, now, the, the cow story, and this is the red cow story, not the golden cow. The red cow story is that the Israelites are given the ruling or the commanding that they should sacrifice a cow. And this cow... Um, for, for the Israelites, they do not know exactly what to do, so they procrastinate. They procrastinate the sacrifice of this cow, and the story is really about the way in which ultimately the Israelites almost fail to follow God's command, but they do it nevertheless. And this is probably the good story of the Exodus, uh, or not Exodus particularly, but about the Israelites in the Quran, that in fact there is God's grace and blessing on the Israelites because ultimately at least a faction of the Israelites, especially the 70 followers of Moses from the Israelite camp, they decide to realize that they should really obey God and there's good stuff for them to come in the future. There's a history in the future for them to be written and the Exodus story is part of that.
And when the anger subsides in Moses, he took up the tablets, and in their inscription was guidance and mercy for those who are fearful of their Lord. I think this is a critical passage in the Quran. Again, this is part of the Medina revelation, chapter 7, which now the Exodus story is not just about punishment. It's also about the way the word of God comes into the story. And Moses throwing the tablets, it creates a covenant, a kind of a contract, or at least a reminder that now God is present through his word, through his message. Remember the difference, the, the similarities between Moses and Muhammad here is very much pronounced. Both of them are messenger of God, but the messengers of God through his words, through the language of God, the sacred language in which God has brought that to humanity. Um, well, let me just skip through this. Um, so again, in the Muslim commentaries, we also begin to see, uh, you know, uh, reflections on on this positive or utopian, whatever you want to call it, aspect of the Israelites who are now being blessed in the Exodus story. Some of them are, in fact, should be exemplified. And some of the commentaries, and here I have Bukhari, the person who wrote the famous traditional hadith of of of, of for many Muslims the traditions of the prophet, he talks about how God made the Israelites like kings in the wilderness. So the element of uh, wilderness was not just about punishment, even for many of the, some of the Muslim commentators in the past. It has been also very much seen as a story in which eventually justice will be, will be established. A kind of a redemptive tale through which the story of suffering in ultimately will bring about some kind of a salvation on earth. So what I'm arguing here is that the Exodus story is not one of disobedience, but a trial, a test toward salvation, an instructive example demonstrating how God can be present even when he appears to abandon or punish his people. And I have some other examples here again when, when Moses, uh, you know, again, there's Muhammad in the background here. Uh, when Moses said to his people, oh, my people, remember the favor of Allah upon you when he appointed among you prophets and made you possessors and gave you that which he had not given anyone among the worlds. There's again the reminder that you are blessed because ultimately you will have to find your well, your way through this world. And this is the theme of redemptive suffering. The idea, and again, this is the bit of a theological part of my argument, so I'm not a big fan of redemptive suffering discourse. But nevertheless, I think there is that strong element there. That, and I think that's what makes the whole Exodus story in the Quran highly utopian. The idea that the punishment and the trial that you go through eventually would have you achieve kind of some kind of a salvation of utopia here on earth. And in fact, the word itself, the revelation itself, is the medium through which that utopia is achieved between humanity and God on earth. Now, just quickly, Moses, of course, I mentioned, is the most uh, mentioned Israelite prophet in the Quran. Uh, but make a note here, and all of this will make a, um, uh, underline my argument here, that he's really not, uh, he's a distinct kind of a prophet in the Quranic tradition. He's a king prophet, very much like Solomon, whereas Muhammad is a servant prophet, since he doesn't claim to be a king, at least in the Quranic tradition. But more importantly, and this is where it makes them very similar to both revolutionary figures. In fact, in Islamic tradition, Abraham is also seen to be a revolutionary figure. But more importantly, Moses is the most important one because he's the one that brings down law to humanity. He's the most important Israelite prophet that brings law. And I think the aspect of law and revolution brings out an extremely important part of Islamic history. In fact, the, the, the phenomenon of Islam eh, as what um, Shimon Eisenstadt, my former professor, once called the second breakthrough of axial revolution. The idea of bringing of somehow this attempt to bring the mundane and transcendental together. And this attempt required a revolutionary act in which you could make time and space and you through some kind of a revolutionary action, action and the law, especially the legislative law, and Moses and Muhammad as the legislator of a new utopian society were supposed to do that job. Ultimately, I think there's a lot of similarity between the latter writings of Plato and Moses and Muhammad here, which interesting enough, the Enlightenment age picked up on this with Montesquieu and also wrote about it in a more secularized version of it. 
Exodus story in the Quran is therefore a story of consolidating law on earth, making God visible through the divine message. So the Exodus story is not just a punishment story, but a tale of self-realization of redemptive suffering upon which a utopia is achieved, Medina and the land of promise. See the parallel with the Exodus story and the Hijra of Muhammad, and I think it's a good way of looking at the Exodus story as a performative history, rather than simply a, a something just to be remembered for, or for some kind of a moral ethical purpose. Thank you very much. Wow. So I guess this Exodus story has had some uh, effects in uh, the history of civilization. Uh, we're happy to entertain questions. Yes, Gary? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Steve Russell. Um, Hi. I appreciate that your argument is that it's, it's not about disobedience, but as somebody who is completely outside of uh, the topic, that, that's the part that interests me. I'm just wondering if there's something that traditional exegetes latch on to uh, about the disobedience. Is, is it a specific punishment for something specific that the Israelites did, or is it just sort of a, a general uh, punishment from God because of general disobedience? I think it's a generic one. I think, remember, most of the Muslim commentaries were written in the late Umayyad period, which is the 8th century, and the early Abbasid period, which is the 8th, 9th centuries. And much of that, of course, reflected, just very much like the Hadith tradition as well, very much reflected of the internal Muslim politics in which Muslims were communicating and sometimes even arguing against each other using many of these traditions in the Quran and, of course, the traditions of the Prophet. But much of the, the, the punishment story was a more of a kind of a moralistic general tone in contrast to the other stories in the Quran. So, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Garrett Galvin. Hi. Um, I was intrigued how um, much you spoke about Moses as a prophet. I think in the Hebrew Bible, we generally see him as a prophet in Deuteronomy, and it's really more the exception than the norm. Um, why do you think they focus so much on um, Moses as a prophet in the Quran? That's a very good point. There is a difference in the Islamic tradition between prophet and messenger. A prophet is an ethical kind of a, a moral leader who's, who's able to lead the community. And he could, in the case of Moses, also be the carrier of God's message. Moses was an exception out of all the Israelite prophets in the Islamic tradition. But Muhammad is not only just a prophet, but he's also the ultimate messenger. And I think that's what brought Moses and Muhammad together so much in the Quranic uh, uh, narrative. Uh, so I think that's why this, and also another thing is that if uh, I mentioned the idea that the, the prophetic stories were very much pronounced towards the late Mecca era and the early Medina era, that I think had a lot to do with the fact that Muhammad somehow had to legitimize the early Muslim community as part of the Abrahamic tradition. Now, why did he start to do it in Mecca? I think that's still a mystery because of a strong polytheistic environment he was living in, he was not encountering the Christians and the Jews. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, in fact, there was a strong Jewish and Christian element in the city of Mecca already in which he could have used the story to legitimize himself as an Abrahamic prophet and also legitimize the new Muslim community. But we do know in the city of Medina, specifically the, the mosaic or the, 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 the stories about Moses and reference to Israel prophet very much made in a way of dialoguing with the Jewish tribes in the city of Medina. Uh, Medina. So we have to localize it, we have to situationize the Quran, and I, I know I could get in trouble if I say this in another setting, especially if in Iran, but, but that's how I see it. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting paper. Uh, as you showed very well, there is no coherent Exodus narrative in the Quran. It's all kind of allusions to different episodes. So my question is, what what do you need, or what do, do the addressees need to understand these allusions? So how are these allusions related to the biblical or Jewish traditions about the Exodus, because I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interacting uh, process which presupposes some knowledge, and mm -hmm. what can we say about this knowledge? 
I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly. But oh, sorry. The, the question is, uh, if you read until today, if somebody reads the Quran and does mm. not know the Bible, mm. I think he's lost somewhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, so my question is about uh, the allusions to the Exodus and also the new mm. accents that are given, for instance, for Pharaoh and so. Mm. Uh, what can we say uh, about this uh, procedure in relation to, uh, yeah, sure, let's sure. say, Bible or Jewish Exodus traditions? Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. There's a huge difference, I think, with the Quran in contrast to the Bible, both Old and New Testament. <laughs> And I think it's because the Quran was put together, quite frankly, very confusingly. And it was done because of, of a response to historical events with the third caliph, who quickly tried to put it together because people apparently were coming up with new versions of the Quran. And I think a, a reader who does not know the Bible and starts reading the Quran, he or she would get confused. Uh, so there is that element of confusion in the Quran, and of course a devout Muslim would not agree with that, but I think as a, as, a, as a result, the Exodus story will not be clearly pronounced in contrast to the Bible as, as, uh, in the Quran. And I think, again, that really goes back to the way the Quran was put together in the first place, that it was a very confusing process, and in fact there was a lot of politics involved. In fact, there's one story, which again is one of those interesting mysteries of the Quran. There was another Quran that was compiled together by Ali, the son-in-law and the cousin of Muhammad, right the time when Muhammad dies. And the question is, what happened to that other Quran, which had a different kind of a chronological uh, a compil a compilation of, of the Quran? So, you know, we just have to remember the Quran is, 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 is a book of its time, and it's a very confusing book at times. And, and that, I think, a first reader could get very much confused. Okay. You're in trouble. Okay. <laughs> no, no, for saying that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, of course, I'm in trouble. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I also want to add one of the amazing things is that in these stories, you were talking about the, the Aaron stories and grabbing by the beard. Sometimes we have uh, preservation of medieval Jewish midrash from mm -hmm. the Jews of Medina and the Jewish tribes in, in Arabia that are sometimes corroborated by other medieval sources. Mm. So, I, so some of those stories you were talking about, I, I, I bet, wow, okay. are what Muhammad and people heard from the, the Midrash of the time. So they're filling in for us another stage in the cultural memory, the development of the reimagining of these traditions. So the Jewish and, and Muslim traditions really uh, interact sure. in, on def several different really interesting levels. Thank you for that wonderful Thank you. talk. Thank you.